Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The curtain will rise on our production very shortly. But first, the management of this theater feels it would be a bit unkind if we didn't first warn you that tonight's production includes rowdy content, some strong language, and supernatural themes. There's also the depiction of the imbibing of strong spirits. All ages will require adult or guardian supervision. There's also a cast substitution. This evening, the role of Jack Pringle will be played by Alan Wrench. Thank you for your kind attention, and now on to the show. Enjoy. Woohoo! Yeah! Uh-huh. Varney the Vampire. Uh-huh. Or the Feast of Blood. <laughs> <laughs> Written by Thomas Peckett Prest. Sometimes attributed also to James Malcolm Reimer. Told to you by Edward E. French. Chapter 15. The Old Admiral and His Servant. The Communication from the Landlord of the Nelson's Arms. While those matters of most grave and serious import were going on at the hall, while each day, and almost each hour in each day, was producing more and more conclusive evidence upon a matter which at first had seemed too monstrous to be at all credited, it may well be supposed what a wonderful sensation was produced among the gossip mongers of the neighborhood by the exaggerated reports that had reached them. The servants who had left the hall on no other account, as they declared, but sheer fright at the awful visits of the vampire, spread the news far and wide, so that in the adjoining villages and market towns, the vampire of Bannerworth Hall became quite a staple article of conversation. Such a positive godsend for the lovers of the marvelous had not appeared in the countryside. Within the memory of that sapient individual, the oldest inhabitant, And, moreover, there was one thing which staggered some people of better education and maturer judgments, and that was that the more they took pains to inquire into the matter, in order, if possible, to put an end to what they considered a gross lie from the commencement, the more evidence they found to stagger their own senses upon the subject. Everywhere, then, in every house, public as well as private, something was being continually said of the vampire, Nursery maids began to think a vampire vastly superior to old Scratch and old Bogey as a means of terrifying their infant charges into quietness, if not to sleep, till they themselves became too much afraid upon the subject to mention it. But nowhere was gossiping carried on upon the subject with more systematic fervor than at an inn called the Nelson's Arms, which was in the high street of the nearest market town to the hall. There, it seemed as if the lovers of the horrible made a point of holding their headquarters, and so thirsty did the numerous discussions make the guests that the landlord was heard to declare that he, from his heart, really considered a vampire as very nearly equal to a contested election. It was towards the evening of the same day that Marchdale and Henry made their visit to Sir Francis Varney that a post-chaise drew up to the inn we have mentioned. In the vehicle were two persons of exceedingly dissimilar appearance and general aspect. One of these people was a man who seemed fast verging upon 70 years of age, although from his still ruddy and embrowned complexion and stentorian voice, it was quite evident he intended yet to keep time at arm's length for many years to come. He was attired in ample and expensive clothing, but every article had a naval animus about it if we may be allowed such an expression with regard to clothing. On his buttons was an anchor, and the general assortment of color of the clothing as nearly assimilated as possible to the undressed naval uniform of an officer of high rank some fifty or sixty years ago. His companion was a younger man, and about his appearance there was no secret at all. He was a genuine sailor, and he wore the shore costume of one. He was hearty looking and well dressed, and evidently well fed. As the chaise drove up to the door of the inn, this man made an observation to the other to the following effect. Ahoy! Well, you lover, what now? cried the other. They called this the Nelson's Arms, and you know, shiver me that for the best half of his life he had but one. Damn you! was the only rejoinder he got for his observation, but with that he seemed very well satisfied. 
Eve two. He then shouted to the postillion, who was about to drive the chaise into the yard. Eve two, you lovely son of a gun. We don't want to go into a dock. Ah, said the old man. Let's get out, Jack. This is the port. And you hear? And be cursed to you. Let's have no swearing, damn you. Nor bad language, you lazy swab. Aye, aye. Cried Jack. I've not been ashore now a matter of ten years and not learnt a little shore-going politeness, Admiral. I ain't been your wallet to shame without learning a little about land reckonings. Nobody would take me for a sailor now, I'm thinking, Admiral. Hold your noise! Aye, aye, sir. Jack, as he was called, bundled out of the chaise when the door was opened with a movement so closely resembling what would have ensued had he been dragged out by the collar that one was tempted almost to believe that such a feat must have been accomplished all at once by some invisible agency. He then assisted the old gentleman to alight, and the landlord of the inn commenced the usual profusion of bows with which a passenger by post-chaise is usually welcomed in preference to one by a stagecoach. Be quiet, will you? shouted the admiral, for such indeed he was. Be quiet. Best accommodation, sir. Good wine, well-aired beds, good attendance, fine... They lay there, <laughs> said Jack, and he gave the landlord what no doubt he considered a gentle admonition, but which consisted of such a dig in the ribs that he made as many evolutions as the clown in a pantomime when he vociferates hot codlings. Now, Jack, where's the sailing instructions? Said his master. Yes, sir, in the locker, said Jack as he took from his pocket a letter, which he handed to the Admiral. Won't you step in, sir? said the landlord, who had begun now to recover a little from the dig in the ribs. What's the use of coming into harbour and paying harbour dues and all that sort of thing till we know if it's the right, you lubber, eh? No, oh dear me, sir, of course. <laughs> God bless me. What can the old gentleman mean? The Admiral opened the letter and read... If you stop at the Nelson's Arms at Etoxeter, you will hear of me, and I can be sent for when I will tell you more. Yours very obediently and humbly, Josiah Crinkles. Who the deuce is he? This is Etoxeter, sir. And here you are, sir, at the Nelson's Arms. Good beds, good wine, good... Silence! You, yes, sir, oh, of course. Who the devil is Josiah Crinkles? <laughs> he makes me laugh, sir. Who the devil indeed? They do say the devil and lawyers, sir, know something of each other. He <laughs> makes me smile. I'll make you smile on the other side of that damned great hatchway of a mouth of yours in a minute. Who is Crinkles? Oh, Mr. Crinkles, sir. Everybody knows he's a most respectable attorney, sir, indeed. Highly respectable man, a sir. A lawyer? Yes, sir, a lawyer. Well, I'm damned. Jack gave a long whistle, and both master and man looked at each other aghast. Now hang me, cried the admiral. If ever I was so taken in all my life. Aye, aye, sir. Said Jack, to come a hundred and seventy miles to see a damned swab of a rascally lawyer. Aye, aye, sir. I'll smash him, Jack. Your honour? Get into the chaise again. Well, but where's Master Charles? Lawyers, in course, sir, are all blessed rogues, but how some devil he may have for once in his life, this here one of them told us the right channel, and if so be as he has, don't be the Yankee to leave him among the pirates. I'm ashamed on you. You infernal scoundrel, how dare you preach to me in such a way, you lubbery rascal. Cause you deserves it. Mutiny, mutiny, by Jove. <laughs> Jack, I'll put you in irons. You're a scoundrel and no seaman. No seaman? Not a bit of one. Very good. It's time then, as I was off the purse's books. Goodbye to you. I only hopes as you may get a better seaman to stick to you and be your wallet to sham nor Jack Pringle. That's all the arm I wish you. You didn't call me no seaman in the Bay of Corfu when the bullets were Scotland our knobs. Jack, you rascal, give us your fin. Come here, you damned villain. You leave me, will you? Not if I know it. Come in then. Don't tell me I'm no seaman. Call me a waggabone if you like, but don't hurt my feelings. There I'm tender as a baby, I am. Don't do it. Confound you, who is doing it? The devil. Who is? Don't then. Thus wrangling, they entered the inn, to the great amusement of several bystanders who had collected to hear the altercation between them. Would you like a private room, sir? Said the landlord. What's that to you? Said Jack. Hold your noise, will you? Cried his master. Yes. I should like a private room and some grog. Strong as the devil. Put in, Jack. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Good wines, good beds, good... You said all that before, you know. Remarked Jack as he bestowed upon the landlord another terrific dig in the ribs. 
Hello, cried the Admiral. Can you send for that infernal lawyer, Mr. Landlord? Mr. Crinkles, sir? Yes, yes. Who may I have the honour to say, sir, wants to see him? Admiral Bell. <laughs> certainly, Admiral, certainly. You will find him a very conversable, nice, gentlemanly little man, sir. And tell him as Jack Pringle is here, too. Oh, yes, yes. Of course, of course, <laughs> said the landlord, who was in such a state of confusion from the digs in the ribs he had received and the noise his guests had already made in his house that, had he been suddenly put upon his oath, he would scarcely have liked to say which was the master and which was the man. The idea now, Jack, said the admiral, of coming all this way to see a lawyer. Aye, aye, sir. If he'd said he was a lawyer, we would have known what to do. But it's a take-in, Jack. So I think. As some devil will serve him out when we catch him, you know. Good. So we will. And then again, he may know something about Master Charles, sir, you know. Lord love him. Don't you remember when he came aboard to see you once at Portsmouth? Ah, I do indeed. And how he said he hated the French, and quite a baby, too. What perseverance and sense. Uncle, he says to you, when I'm a big man, I'll go in a ship and fight all the French in a heap, says he. And beat him, too, my boy. Says you, cause you thought he'd forgot that. And then he says, what's the use of saying that, stupid? Don't we always beat him? The Admiral laughed and rubbed his hands as he cried aloud. <laughs> I remember Jack. I remember him. I was stupid to make such a remark. I know. You was a damned old fool, I thought you. Come, come. Hello there. Well then, what do you call me now seaman for? Why, Jack, you bear malice like a marine. There you go again. Goodbye. Do you remember when we were yard arm to yard arm with those two Yankee frigates and took them both? You didn't call me a marine then, when the scuppers were running with blood. Was I a seaman then? You were, Jack. You were. And you saved my life. I didn't. You did. I say I didn't. It was a marlin spike. But I say you did, you rascally scoundrel. I say you did, and I won't be contradicted in my own ship. Call this your ship? No! Damn it, I... I said... Mr. Crinkles, said the landlord, flinging the door wide open, and so at once putting an end to the discussion which always apparently had a tendency to wax exceedingly warm. The shark, by God, said Jack. A little, neatly dressed man made his appearance and advanced rather timidly into the room. Perhaps he had heard from the landlord that the parties who had sent for him were of a rather violent sort. So you are Crinkles, are you? cried the admiral. Sit down. Though you were a lawyer. Thank you, sir. I am an attorney, certainly. And my name, as certainly, is Crinkles. Look at that. The Admiral placed the letter in the little lawyer's hands, who said, Am I to read it? Yes, to be sure. Aloud? Read it to the devil, if you like, in a pig's whisper, or a West India hurricane. Oh, very good, sir. I, I am willing to be agreeable, so I'll read it aloud, if it's all the same to you. He then opened the letter and read as follows. Mm -hmm. To... <clears throat> <clears throat> to Admiral Bell. Admiral, being from various circumstances aware that you take a warm and a praiseworthy interest in your nephew, Charles Holland, I venture to write to you concerning a matter in which your immediate and active cooperation with others may rescue him from a condition which will prove, if allowed to continue, very much to his detriment and ultimate unhappiness. You are then hereby informed that he, Charles Holland, has, much earlier than he ought to have done, returned to England, and that the object of his return is to contract a marriage into a family in every way objectionable, and with a girl who is highly objectionable. You, Admiral, are his nearest and almost his only relative in the world. You are the guardian of his property, and, therefore, it becomes a duty on your part to interfere to save him from the ruinous consequences of a marriage which is sure to bring ruin and distress upon himself and all who take an interest in his welfare. The family he wishes to marry into is named Bannerworth, and the young lady's name is Flora Bannerworth. When, however, I inform you that a vampire is in that family, and that if he marries into it, he marries a vampire, and will have vampires for children. I trust I have said enough to warn you upon the subject, and to induce you to lose no time in repairing to the spot. If you stop at the Nelson's Arms at Etoxeter, you will hear from me. 
I can be sent for when I will tell you more. Yours very obediently and humbly. Josiah Crinkles. Hmm. P.S. I enclose you Dr. Johnson's definition of a vampire, which is as follows. Vampire, a German bloodsucker, by which you may perceive how many vampires from time immemorial must have been well entertained at the expense of John Bull at the court of St. James, where no thing hardly is to be met with but German bloodsuckers. The lawyer ceased to read and the amazed look with which he glanced at the face of Admiral Bell would, under any other circumstances, have much amused him. His mind, however, was by far too much engrossed with the consideration of the danger of Charles Holland, his nephew, to be amused at anything. So, when he found that the little lawyer said nothing, he bellowed out, Well, sir? Well, well, said the attorney. I've sent for you, and here you are. And here I am, and here's Jack Pringle. What have you got to say? I, just this much said Mr. Crinkles, recovering himself a little. Just this much, sir. I never saw that letter before in all my life. You never saw it? Never. Didn't you write it? On my solemn word of honor, sir, I did not. Jack Pringle whistled, and the Admiral looked puzzled. Like the Admiral in the song, too, he grew paler. And then Mr. Crinkles added, Who has forged my name to a letter such as this? I cannot imagine. As for writing to you, sir, I never heard of your existence, except publicly as one of those gallant officers who have spent a long life in nobly fighting their country's battles, and who are entitled to the admiration and the applause of every Englishman. Jack and the Admiral looked at each other in amazement, and then the latter exclaimed, What? This from a lawyer? A lawyer, sir said Crinkles, may know how to appreciate the deeds of gallant men, although he may not be able to imitate them. That letter, sir, is a forgery, and I now leave you only much gratified at the incident which has procured me the honour of an interview with a gentleman whose name will live in the history of his country. Good day, sir. Good day. No, I'm damned if you go like that, said Jack, as he sprang to the door and put his back against it. You shall take a glass with me in honour of the wooden walls of old England. Damn if you was twenty lawyers. That's right, Jack. Come, Mr. Crinkles. I think for your sake there may be two decent lawyers in the world, and you one of them. We must have a bottle of the best wine the ship, I, I mean the house, can afford together. If it is your command, Admiral, I obey with pleasure. And although I assure you on my honour I did not write that letter, yet some of the matters mentioned in it are so generally notorious here that I can afford you information concerning them. Can you? I regret to say I can, for I respect the parties. Sit down, then. Sit down, Jack. Run to the steward's room and get the wine. We will go into it now, starboard and larboard. Who the deuce could have written that letter? I have not the least idea, sir. Well, well, never mind. It has brought me here. That's something, so I won't grumble much at it. I didn't know my nephew was in England, and I dare say he didn't know I was. But here we both are, and I won't rest till I've seen him and ascertained how the... What's its name? The Vampire. Ah! The Vampire. Shiver my timbers. Sir Jack Pringle, who now brought in some wine, much against the remonstrances of the waiters of the establishment, who considered that he was treading upon their vested interests by doing so. Shiver my timbers if I knows what a vampire is, unless he's some distant relation to Davy Jones. Hold your ignorant tongue. Nobody wants you to make a remark, you great lubber. Very good said Jack, and he sat down the wine on the table, and then retired to the other end of the room, remarking to himself that he was not called a great lubber on a certain occasion when bullets were scuttling their knobs, and there were yardarm and yardarm with God knows who. Now, Mr. Lawyer, said Admiral Bell, who had about him a large share of the habits of a rough sailor. Now, Mr. Lawyer, here is a glass first to our better acquaintance, for damn if I don't like you. You are very good, sir. <laughs> Not at all. There was a time when I'd just as soon have thought of asking a young shark to supper with me in my own cabin as a lawyer. But I begin to see that there may be such a thing as a decent good sort of fellow seen in the law. So here's good luck to you. And you shall never want a friend or a bottle while Admiral Bell has a shot in the locker. Gammon, said Jack. Damn you! What do you mean by that? roared the Admiral in a furious tone. I wasn't speaking to you, shouted Jack, about two octaves higher. It's two boys in the street as is pretending they've got a fight, and I know damn well they won't. Hold your noise. I'm coming. 
I wasn't told to hold my noise when our knobs were being scuttled off Beirut. Never mind him, Mr. Lawyer, added the Admiral. He don't know what he's talking about. Never mind him. You go on and tell me all you know about the, uh, the, the vampire. Ah, I always forget the name of strange fish. I suppose, after all, it's something of the mermaid order. Th th that I cannot say, sir. But certainly the story, in all its painful particulars, has made a great sensation all over the country. Indeed. Yes, sir. You shall hear how it occurred. It appears that one night, Miss Flora Bannerworth, a young lady of great beauty, and respected and admired by all who knew her, was visited by a strange being who came in at the window. My eye, said Jack. It weren't me. I wish it had been. So petrified by fear was she that she had only time to creep half out of the bed and to utter one cry of alarm when the strange visitor seized her in his grasp. Damn my pigtail, said Jack. What a squall there must have been, to be sure. Do you see this bottle? roared the Admiral. To be sure I does. I think it's time I seed another. You scoundrel, I'll make you feel it against that damned stupid head of yours if you interrupt this gentleman again. Don't be violent. <laughs> well, as I was saying, continued the attorney, she did by great good fortune manage to scream, which had the effect of alarming the whole house. The door of her chamber, which was fast, was broken open. Yes, yes. Ah, cried Jack. You may imagine the horror and the consternation of those who entered the room to find her in the grasp of a fiend-like figure whose teeth were fastened on her neck and who was actually draining her veins of blood. The devil! Before anyone could lay hands sufficiently upon the figure to detain it, it had fled precipitately from its dreadful repast Shots were fired after it, in vain. And they let it go? They followed it, I understand, as well as they were able, and saw it scale the garden wall of the premises. There it escaped, leaving, as you may well imagine, on all their minds, a sensation of horror difficult to describe. Well, I never did hear anything the equal of that. Jack, what do you think of it? I haven't begun to think yet, said Jack. But what about my nephew, Charles? Of him I know nothing. Nothing? Not a word, Admiral. I was not aware you had a nephew or that any gentleman bearing that or any other relationship to you had any sort of connection with these mysterious and most unaccountable circumstances. I tell you all I have gathered from common report about this vampire business. Further, I know not. I assure you. Well, a man can't tell what he don't know. It puzzles me to think who could possibly have written me this letter. That I am completely at a loss to imagine. I assure you, my gallant sir, that I am much hurt at the circumstance of anyone using my name in such a way. But, nevertheless, as you are here, permit me to say that it will be my pride, my pleasure, and the boast of the remainder of my existence to be of some service to so gallant a defender of my country, and one whose name, along with the memory of his deeds, is engraved upon the heart of every Briton. Quite equal to a book he talks, said Jack. I never could read one myself on account of not knowing how, but I've heard him read and that's just the sort of incomprehensible gammon. We don't want any of your ignorant remarks, said the Admiral. So you be quiet. Aye, aye, sir. Now, Mr. Lawyer, you are an honest fellow, and an honest fellow is generally a sensible fellow. Sir, I thank you. If so be as what this letter says is true, my nephew Charles has got a liking for this girl who has got her neck bitten by a vampire, you see. I perceive, sir. Now what would you do? One of the most difficult, as well, perhaps, as one of the most ungracious of tasks, is to interfere with family affairs. The cold and steady eye of reason sees things in such very different lights to what they appear to those whose feelings and whose affections are much compromised in their results. Very true. Go on. 
Taking, my dear sir, what in my humble judgment appears to be a reasonable view of this subject, I should say it would be a dreadful thing for your nephew to marry into a family any member of which was liable to visitations of a vampire. It wouldn't be pleasant. The young lady might have children. Oh, lots, cried Jack. Hold your noise, Jack. Aye, aye, sir. And she might herself, actually, when after death she became a vampire, come and feed on her own children. Become a vampire? What, is she going to be a vampire too? My dear sir, don't you know that it is a remarkable fact, as regards the physiology of vampires, that whoever is bitten by one of those dreadful beings becomes a vampire? The devil! It is a fact, sir. She might bite us all, and we should be a whole ship's crew of vampires. There would be a confounded go. It's not pleasant said the admiral, as he rose from his chair and paced to and fro in the room. It's not pleasant. Hang me up by my own yardarm, if it is. Who said it was? Who asked you, you brute? Well, sir, added Mr. Crinkles, I have given you all the information I can, and I can only repeat what I before had the honour of saying more at large, namely, that I am your humble servant to command, and that I shall be happy to attend upon you at any time. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Ah. Crinkles. Ah. Crinkles, you shall hear from me again, sir, shortly. Now that I am down here, I will see to the very bottom of this affair were it deeper than fathom ever sounded. Charles Holland was my poor sister's son. He's the only relative I have in the wide world, and his happiness is dearer to my heart than my own. God bless you, sir, he said. Farewell. Good day to you. Goodbye, lawyer, cried Jack. Mind how you go. Damn me if you don't seem a decent sort of fellow, and after all, you may give the devil a clear berth and get into heaven's straits with a flowing sheet, provided as you don't, towards the end of the voyage, make any lubbery blunders. The old admiral threw himself into a chair with a deep sigh. Hmm. Jack, said he. Aye, aye, sir. What's to be done now? Jack opened the window to discharge the superfluous moisture from an enormous quid he had indulged himself with while the lawyer was telling about the vampire. And then turning his face towards his master, he said, Do. What shall we do? Why, go at once and find out Charles, our nevy, and ask him all about it. And see the young lady, too. And lay hold of the vampire, if we can, as well and go with the whole affair broadside to broadside till we make a prize of all the particulars, after which we can turn it over in our minds again and see what's to be done. Jack, you are right. I know as I am. Come along. Do you know now which way to steer? Of course not. I was never in this latitude before, and the channel looks intricate. We will hail a pilot, Jack, and then we shall be all right. And if we strike, it will be his fault. Which is a mighty great consolation, said Jack. Come along. Copyright exists on all recordings issued by Edward E. French. Any unauthorized broadcasting, public performance, copying, or re-recording of these audiobooks in any manner whatsoever will constitute an infringement of such copyright. Editing, alteration, copying, or redistribution inconsistent with copyright laws is prohibited, whether by digital, electronic, or other means. Links may be used, provided that full and clear credit is given to Edward E. French with appropriate and specific direction to the original content. Direct inquiries regarding this recording to Edward E. French at email edwardfrench zero six at hotmail.com. Subscribe to the Fiction Fantastique channel www.youtube.com forward slash French Edward 06.